Um, and just a little bit about, about me. Um, you know, I, I, I grew up in a house, you know, um, is my mother, right? So I grew up in a house where finding um, Puerto Rican studies was, you know, was, was critical, right? Where it was part of your search for self was this kind of search for society, right? And so that, that, that took me to kind of like different places. Um, personally, I, I'm a PhD student, but I also have a GED, right? Because school, uh, well, besides we all, yeah, right, so, right, so right there, right? GED. Oh, wow. right. <laughs> I noticed that. Because um, cause partly for me, you know, there were, I realized that there was, a, there, was a, there was a problem, you know, when you're educated in the United States, or as Agadio mentioned, you know, even in Puerto Rico, right, where there's this history of the, the books are an attempt to Americanize you, the language might have been different depending on the decade that you're being educated, right? The answers that get given to you don't become answers that actually help you to understand either your place in the world or the world as it is, right? And so I realized that school was not helping me figure shit out, right? So, <laughs> so I needed to drop out so that they'd stop dumbing me down. I'm not saying this as a strategy for anyone to, you know, uh, promote, you know, um, but, uh, you know, si piensa como son las escuelas, you know, maybe it's better for, you know, um, people to try to educate themselves and make that part of their life's mission. Um, and so that became something for me. So studying Puerto Rican history for me um, was a way of understanding myself, but really getting better answers um, about how the world um, works. Yeah. And uh, so I, I just mentioned that as an introduction, because if you notice um, something about Arcadio, something about, you know, what, what Edie says, um, um, Jose will probably say something similar about myself, is in studying Puerto Rican studies, in studying Puerto Rican history and literature and learning about kind of like yourself as a member of this kind of collective body, right? This, this nation that has been dispersed, that has a rich history, um, you start to understand things differently. Yeah? You understand, well, how did Puerto Ricans come to be, right? How was Puerto Rico coming to be? You know, from, um, from my mother's work, you look at, you know, she's looking at people and how language was created, right? How language had all these elements. Right. Well, that gives you a different sense of understanding of what is it to be Puerto Rican, right? Because you'll hear sometimes people be like, oh, what are you? I'm Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. Either because you're light-skinned or, you know. Um, and and it, when you go through this, you realize, wow, that, that really makes no sense <laughs> for you to call yourself Spanish, right? And, and, and our popular culture, whether it's Puerto Rican or American, right, has so many things that are nonsensical. Right? That as someone mentioned in the crowd, it's either dominated by media, right? it's dominated by um, materials that make you try to think of yourself in one way, and you look at your history and you realize your history is actually a lot more about struggle, about people trying to define themselves, about people trying to self-determine their history and their identity. Right? And that's a different history that you're going to get from school. Right? So for me, Puerto Rican Studies is this fascinating way of really understanding the world, Puerto Rico's place in it, and realizing that um, she mentioned it, but she, she left, this role of agency. When you understand Puerto Rican history, you really realize that it's a, it's a, it's a history of agency, right? It's like we become, we are part of making Puerto Rico. And I know she had mentioned how um, she feels sometimes like Puerto Rico just reacts to things. Well, the piece that I want to do on workers' history in Puerto Rico is really not a history of um, Puerto Rican workers just reacting to things. In many ways, it's Puerto Rican workers trying to create situations for themselves, right? Create situations of justice, um, for social justice, sometimes explicitly for socialism as an alternative, right? And, and some of this discussion Hosean will talk about, about the debates between nationalism and socialism, right? About nationalism as, as this philosophy and this organization of, of the nation, and socialism that looks at it in a different way, right? Is that looks at how do you free the nation, but who is it that frees the nation? Is it the workers or the elites? Well, in the history, you see that many times the elites have tried to dominate and define Puerto Rico as being Eurocentric, as being Espanol, as the language being a particular language, right? Somos, you know, somos de España y el otro. In the workers, well, in the map that, that um, Guillermo Barral has about the slave rebellions, um, I'm going to talk about some books, and you see the ending of the slave rebellions, and what you see happening is the beginning of the workers' organizing, right? And so, you know, the, the rebellions were just in the form of slavery because that's the form that the economy and workers existed under, right? The, work, the people who did the work in Puerto Rico, so many of them, if you're talking about cane or coffee, something like that, they were slaves. So those were the workers then, right? Once abolition occurs and they are no longer slaves, they're workers, right? And they organize themselves in a different way because they had the freedom of, of being able to travel and organize and form organizations and associations, right? But it's the same history of struggle, of people trying to create social justice for themselves and trying to find organized, organized uh, ways of doing so. Um, so 
Before I jump into that, there's one more thing that I wanted to mention. You've noticed all the debates that we're having about history, right? Um, and we call this historiography, right? Which is not the study of history, but the study of the history of history, yeah. right? Which is like, we're studying how people have written history. Because writing history is very powerful, right? It gives you a sense, or it takes away a sense of understanding, right? How you understand your history gives you a sense of who am I, how did we get here, and then what does that mean for my future, if anything? Right? Is there a connection between how I understand where I come from and where I may go, right? And I think Gadio said something about, um, he said a few uh, comments from, um, from Orwell, right? But we have our own saying that is uh, basically similar to Orwell's saying, right? El que no sabe su historia está condenado a repetirlo, right? The person who does not know their history is condemned to repeat it, right? So Orwell has his saying, we kind of have our own popular saying, um, but it's the same thing, right? History is a battleground, right? And so what we're doing today is we're looking at this reinterpretation. These are not just books that created history. In many ways, they reinterpreted history, right? They knew that there had been history written about Puerto Rican women, Puerto Rican workers, Puerto Ricans as, as a country, right? And they knew that part of their job was that they were gonna have to challenge some of these earlier stories about Puerto Ricans in order to create the space to tell more stories. And in order to do that, it had to be also deeply researched. But that research was broad, right? It's archives, but sometimes it's also oral history, right? When I talk about um, Logario Feliado from Fernando Pico, you're gonna see that he uses a lot of oral history to understand. So this is where I try to get interactive. Why would we, as a, if you think about Puerto Rico, right? If you think about the video that we ended with, why would we need oral history to kind of get a, to, to include that as a piece in understanding the entirety of the Puerto Rican uh, situation? What usefulness is oral history to us? Now, I, and I'm asking you that to see if uh, we can all have a dialogue. Does anybody have an abuela? Mm -hmm. Yes, most people have abuelas, right? Yeah. <laughs> Does your abuela have a bunch of dichos and sayings? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like what? Dichos and sayings, is that? Yes, yeah, sayings. No, not sayings. Oh, oh, sayings. Yes. Okay. You know, dichos, Refran phrases, um, refranes. Um, the one that comes to mind when I was talking about the Puerto Rican I guess kind of like how blood is thicker than water, or like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't remember how it exists in Spanish. Right. But that one was, it wasn't really my blood, it was like my aunt. Your aunt, okay. Right. 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 Exactly. Right, right, right. Go ahead. The other one is, uh, and it's Los Hijos. Mm -hmm. Maybe your family. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, I mean, like, I don't know. Right, right, right. But, I mean, there are well, I mean, different things. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if it's maybe in my family or not. No. Like, I know, like, I've heard of it and I've seen it. Right. So I can't even say, you know, right. like, I understand where it's coming so from. So sayings have a relationship know. to reality on some level. Well, I was going to ask you a question. Um, I guess oral tradition is um, and that so, wisdom helps to form your right, and that you know you you listen to these things, you take these things in. It's like, well, okay, grandma told me this, or mom told me this, or dad told me this, or whoever, and you you know you reflect that, and you you go into the world, and you do those things according to, right. or not according to, like you know that changes like how you look at the world. That's right, exactly. It changes and it helps to form how you look at the world. Los compañeros atrás. That's a good one. <laughs> so, so those two are classic ones that are very well. Yeah, uh, not in nature, but um, the reason why you want to listen to your elders is to learn about how they lived right. that lifetime. But sometimes right. it's subjective. It, well, that's the trickiness, right? And so we're going to come to that in a second. Um, it's also important, I guess, because just your oral history, just the way that you are saying your history is also part of your culture. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead of just like reading it somewhere. 
Right, mm -hmm. right. So all of this, so the sayings that are being handed down from generation to generation, right? They reflect wisdom. They reflect sometimes just very subjective sayings. They reflect sayings that come from earlier time periods that if you were able to study that saying, you'd see that it comes from, you know, not just a subjective, but a people's experience, right? Not subjective in the sense that of an individual, right? But when, when sayings become so collective, right, you realize that they're kind of like a collective memory, right? They're expressions that come out of a people's experiences, right? And so in this particular author, Fernando Vigo, which we'll come to in a second, he uses oral history, but he doesn't leave it as that. He puts oral history as one of the elements Elements because he realizes that much of our history, uh, particularly if you were from rural areas where you might not have been writing things down, right, or you were coming from sectors that you used music and song, like bomba or plena, to communicate, that's not a written history. So in order to get a fuller history, you needed to include all the ways that a people used to communicate. And written is only just one way. They extended family back there, friends, you know, family members. And then it's only recently, maybe five years ago, that I found out that in fact the uh, uh, the invaders, the the American government, uh, had a program where they were sterilizing right. them right. to keep the population, the Puerto Rican population, down. So even in that casual talk, mostly ella ella está operada because she was a victim mm -hmm. of the sterilization of program in Puerto Rico. So uh, right. it's also right. striking and, and, and it shows a reality that's not written for us. Right. And, and, and it's a great thing that you pointed out because it also means that sometimes we'll have sayings that actually kind of hide, right, or don't fully articulate, right, because that doesn't really, it, 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 gives it, it says it and it puts it on a person as an individual. Mm -hmm. Yet when we find out the history, right, it's, it's a national history that it impacted many women in Puerto Rico, right? And so sometimes the saying communicates, but it can also hide, right? It also doesn't communicate um, completely. Right? So, I gotta operate this myself, I do. Okay. Okay. Uh, All right, so I wanted to start with Lucha Obrera in Puerto Rico, right? And so Lucha Obrera in Puerto Rico is a book written by Angel Tindero Rivera. Now, this is interesting. This is, you see, it's an early book. It's 1971. Now, Quintero Rivera was a historian. Um, he was a scholar in Puerto Rico. And Jose Angel is going to talk a little bit more about his he background. Right, he's, he's, yeah, he's not dead. Sorry. Um, he was, he's in Puerto Rico. When this book comes out, he is a member of a collective of scholars, right? And this, uh, this collective, uh, is it in there at all? Does it, it, does it say? Uh, does no. it say Serep? Okay, well, it's on. It, it doesn't say it there. But Serep was the, the counterpart, I think I've mentioned some of this, I was the counterpart to the Centro de Puerto Ricanos here, right? Um, counterpart in the sense that they're both happening at a time that Puerto Ricans in the United States, Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico are both there's a there's student struggles, there's labor struggles, there's community struggles, and at the same time, those struggles reflected in the academy, where people said, we're not just trying to change our material life on the outside, we're trying to change the information that is said and spoken and written about us, right? And you don't see this just in Puerto Rican studies. This is the time period where clearly you have ethnic studies, you have African American studies, you have women's studies, you have Chicano studies on the West Coast, right? So these are rebellions and academic rebellions, right, and knowledge rebellions, that are happening in many different places. So Serep was the study for the, uh, uh, for the study of the, uh, the reality of the Puerto Rican. Centro de Estudio de la Realidad Puerto Rican, right? And so this is happening in Puerto Rico, and this becomes the first anthology, because it's not really a book, it's an anthology of writings that set up as an organization of scholars put out. And when you look at the, uh, the writings, what they do is they, they give an a, a introduction to these writings, and then what it is is a collection of writings from the early 1900s. Right? And f uh, these are writings from the Federación Libre de Trabajo, right? an organization, uh, the Free Federation of Labor, right? um, from Luisa Capetillo, right? an early feminist, anarchist um, organizer and, um, and reader. She would read to, to tabaqueros. Right? Um, and it starts to document this early history of these kind of worker intellectuals. And you realize just how extensive and how um, educated in a sense with what would normally be have been considered an uneducated people were. They had newspapers. They were they were having debates. They were they were reading books um, or being read to them um, books from all over the world about working class struggles. They were talking about the Paris Commune. They were talking about the Bolshevik Revolution, the Russian Revolution, right? They're debating nationalism, anarchism, 
socialism, right? So these people are engaged as workers in the life of ideas, and these ideas were about right, social change and social transformation, right? And so these people were educating themselves consistently. Alcadio mentions, you know, Bernardo Vega, who comes from that area, right? From, as a tabaquero migrates from Calle in Puerto Rico, comes to the United States and hooks up with other tabaqueros who have the same culture, right? This kind of workers culture going on where they produce their own newspapers. They went out on strike. They debated ideas, right? And so this book, um, Rescata, is a term I'm going to use. This, uh, it rescues this history for a new generation. But it's not, just, like, it's not just uncovering a history, it's also reinterpreting. Because up until that time, the, the history, as they had mentioned, was very much about a passive people, right? Um, uh, one of the books that she didn't, uh, she didn't uh, get a chance to talk about was a book by Silene about a positive vision of the Puerto Rican. Una visión positiva del Puerto Rican, right? It was these very negative, <coughs> passive, elitist views of Puerto Ricans. And so this book becomes an attempt at looking at an earlier, uh, earlier generations of people who were actually not passive, but were arguing and struggling um, for social justice. And, um, and so this becomes kind of like this opening shot by this group set up. Um, Uh, so some of the, um, the readers were actually also reading to people who could not read. Oh, exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, and, and, and Luisa becomes one of those people. Um, because she, Julio um, de Burgos, I think, was also a reader at some point in earlier time where she was connected to the National Party. Mm -hmm. But you're right. These are, these are, when I use the word educated, I didn't mean to imply that they were all literate. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I separated that in particular because literacy means of being able to read the written word. You can be educated. We, we don't consider it that, that, we don't consider it this way because so much of education is based on going through a, a formal schooling system where people learn how to read, right? And for people who are talking about frere, if you have you know, to read the word was to also read the world, right? But obviously the word is there, so you need to be literate. Well, these people may have been literate, but they were educated, right? They were learning, they were debating, they were discussing, and there were people who were literate within this group who are clearly writing newspapers, right? So the reason why I have to separate that is because otherwise we would have the impression that the only people writing newspapers about, or you know, essays or pamphlets about issues of working class anarchism or socialism were coming from the elites or the bourgeoisie, right? And not all of them were, that, that's, that's not true. This is a form of education, even though it is part of a more of an oral history where someone would read to people as they rolled tobacco, you know, as they worked, right? And there was an education process going on. They'd ask questions. Sometimes because of something that was read, sometimes they'd stop work and go on strike, right? So there's clearly a process of education going on. So thank you for pointing that out, because it is distinct from our understanding of educated and literate is the only way to be educated. Also, you had a parallel process going on in the garment industry here in New York City. Jesus Colón, a Puerto Rican in New York, right. Right. written in 61 or 62, I think. Right. 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 Unfortunately, it's out of print now, which oh. documents a lot of the same dynamics. Mm -hmm. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Yes. Also the fact that the Puerto Ricans would do everything and be read to and talk about all this in Spanish, and a lot of the factories and things were owned by Americans who didn't understand them, so they could be talking revolution right under the nose of the boss. Right, right. 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 She's a conspirator. Right. 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 It's, 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 it's the right. bomb like, effect. These people don't even bother learning the language of a place where they're trying to control. Right. So, so think about also that history of how so much of this educational process is subversive subversive and out of the realm of understanding of the people um, who are oppressors or domineers, right? Think about it as like the songs of Plena or the calling of the bomba, right? Or this kind of using Spanish, right? It's a way of communicating and educating a population away from the eyes and ears of those who would not want you to be talking about those topics. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the next book. <laughs> okay, and this is Apuntes para la Historia del Movimiento Obrero Puerto Riqueño. This is kind of an also an early book. And this is interesting. Juan Angel Sinlein writes this actually in 1976, leaving um, Puerto Rico to come to the United States, and he writes this. It gets published in 1978. He, he's at SUNY um, Albany when he writes this book. Um, and the reason why I specify that is just for you to see this kind of continuity relationship in the Puerto Rican community between the island and between the diaspora, right? You know, all of us Puerto Ricans out here, right? So much of our knowledge, like our salsa, is based on that commuting relationship, that, uh, that back and forth, right? And C. Lane writes, but he doesn't write just as a scholar. He writes also as a participant, 
because he was a leader and a participant in the, um, in the late 50s, early 60s, up until the 70s, of the student movements, of the strikes in Puerto Rico, um, of the FUBI, of the Movimiento por Independencia. And so he is someone who is very involved. And when he writes this, he's not just trying to rescue this information. He's also trying to put it in a way that he hopes will um, motivate younger generations to realize that the struggle of workers is critical right, to any future independence project. Right? So for him, it's very much he's trying to uh, challenge, criticize, um, merge um, the tensions between nationalism and, and socialism as a way forward. Right? Because for him, he sees that one of the problems <coughs> is either an interpretation or a divorce between the social struggles of workers and the kind of national struggles for, for independence. Right? And he sees that this is going to be one of the problems. Um, I know Oceana is going to get into that debate a little bit more. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to mention about that is he calls it a notes, he calls it, um, I'm translating in, in, in English for people, um, notes for a history of the Puerto Rican workers movement, right? And so part of it when he says, apuntes um, para la historia, right? He's saying for history, for a history to be completed, right? He's pretty clear in writing the book that this is not the end all be all, right? That these are notes that he's providing because he hopes that people are going to continue to look at the workers' movement and to actually do this work of researching and rescuing um, this history. So he's kind of humble about it. Um, but what's important about this book is that it's still an early event, uh, an early um, overview of the Puerto Rican workers' movement, right? Um, <coughs> Okay. Oh, so that one. Okay. So this book is is um, originally supposed to be out of the group. Um, the reason why I included it though is because it, it, it wasn't written in Spanish, right? It was written in English. Um, but this book, like Sedep, right? Mm -hmm. Sedep is a collective. Uh, is many of the books were written by several authors. Um, this one is written by several authors, but this one is produced here in the United States in 1979, right? This is, I think, the first. Uh, the, the first publication put out by the Secretary of Puerto Rican, right, where we, are, where we are at. And it is a collective effort of several authors, several of them who are key um, people in the foundation of Puerto Rican studies, like Frank Bonilla, um, um, uh, <coughs> and Juan Flores, right, and, and, and Ricardo Campos, and other people who later on helped to create what we know as Puerto Rican studies. Well, this is one of the key documents. But what do they do? Well, their history task force comes together to really look at how is it that the Puerto Rican population comes here? And they actually have this key question that guides them um, that is not there, but I'll read to you. The key question that they ask, and I think, I think it's a still relevant um, question today, and the fact that the question points to um, the forces that kind of shape migration, right? Their key question was, how did Puerto Rico become a nation of, perenni of perennial migrants, right, of continual migrants? destined indefinitely to circulate from, from island to far-flung concentrations in the United States, right? And so instead of looking at our history as a history of migration from Puerto Rico to, you know, to New York City, right, or to places in the United States, they view it as continual circulations and displacements, right? They realize that part of the reasons why people were migrating was because of capitalism, right? The need of capital to have workers um, sometimes, you know, battling each other for cheap wages, or it needed workers to work pineapples in, um, to, get, to do the work in the, in the pineapple fields in Hawaii. So there's Puerto Ricans in Hawaii, right? The first populations of Puerto Ricans in Arizona and California come from people who got off the trains that were taking them uh, to California to then take the uh, steam train uh, boat to Hawaii, who got off and rebelled and stayed there. And those are some of our early communities in the West Coast, right? People who rebelled from this kind of labor domination and stayed out there, right? Um, communities in Lorain, Ohio, where there was industry, right? Communities in early parts of uh, Connecticut, um, in rural parts of Connecticut and Massachusetts, right? Tobacco farm workers, right? All of it based on the needs of capitalists to have workers to come here at a certain time and to be able to do this work, right? And so they start to articulate this history and realizing that this is not the typical story of a migrant, what you sometimes think of a migrant. You think of a person who you know, goes from one place to another in search of a job. And they realize these are not individuals. This was an, uh, a very organized 
planned migration, right? Where you would have groups of people, you know, the plane would be, uh, you know, they'd have a plane, you have, you'd almost have like these beach chairs, the guys would be on the beaches, it's mostly male migration at that point, right? And then they would go to all these variety of places and they would work for temporadas, right? And then sometimes they'd go back home. Where, where my mother lives in Puerto Rico, it's, a, it's in Maricao, in the montañas, it's very high up there in the, in the montaña de San Germán. And there is a little uh, Mogal Crea, no, not Mogal Crea, perdón. There's a little school um, for el, el, el trabajador, trabajador ambulante, el trabajador eh, agrícola. Right, the, the los niños de los trabajadores agrícolas, the immigrants. Right, it's the school for immigrants. Now, many times for Puerto children. Ricans, for the children of immigrants. Many times Puerto Ricans, when you ask, you know, when we talk about immigration in this country, particularly nowadays, when it's either, you know, you talk about, you know, Dominicans or or Mexicans. If you ask a Puerto Rican, they'll be like, oh, I'm a citizen. Right, we have this consciousness that we're not immigrants. Well, here are Puerto Rican scholars at the beginning of Puerto Rican studies stating quite clearly that obviously Puerto Ricans are part of the migration flow. Right? That if migration is about the push and pull of jobs and economies, then Puerto Ricans are right in that circulation. Right? And the reason why I mentioned that school is because here's a school in the mountains of Puerto Rico, which is a school dedicated to educating the children of, mig of migrant workers. Right? And its schedule is based on the schedule of agriculture, which a lot of education is actually based on the schedules of agriculture. That's why you get off in the summer. You know. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Just um, going back to the um, back and forth, that was organized and orchestrated by the farm owners and the corporate you know, right. industries, right. not by us. Well, okay. that is that is true. That is true, but th but it it, 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 it it does it takes away the role of the office of migration in Puerto Rico, which helps to facilitate. Yeah. Right, and in many ways, you have to see that. I, I know we like to have this kind of much more romantic understanding of Puerto Rican history, which is like. Everything is done by the oppressors. But the elites in Puerto Rico no, have a lot, that. right? The, the Puerto Rican yeah. elites themselves, you know, were very clear that in order to make Puerto Rico a successful project, right? Like, you know, uh, the shining star of the Caribbean, right? It, with all the poverty that existed, one of the ways that um, later the Alliance for Progress and these kind of public policy programs, that, these development programs that exist in Puerto Rico was by dispersing the Puerto Rican population, right? By being able to ship off all these workers to other areas, Puerto Rico looks a whole lot better, right? If you know, if four people are hungry but two people leave the house, <laughs> two people leave, and everybody looks good, right? But the other two, quién sabe dónde están, right? You know, they're somewhere else. So, so part of that is, it's, it's, I think it's hard to say it's just kind of like this American influence on Puerto Rico. There was a lot of interest as well by Puerto Rican elites, right? In in being in facilitating and being involved. No, I in meant, yeah, I meant that that's part of the orchestration, right? Yes. Deliberate. Yes. A part of the powers that be, so to speak. Right. Our, our our own Puerto Rican elites. And to give you an example, and this is not, this is not an example necessarily of Puerto Rican elites, but it's a great example of how just planned and organized yeah. our migration was. It wasn't these individual tales of you know one household moving, right? You know, but how hundreds of thousands. I mean, think about it. We've had several moments of massive migration, one of them, ironically, in the last five years, right? There are more Puerto Ricans in the United States than in Puerto Rico. Now, this is a reality, not historically. This is a reality in the last five years, right? The 2010 census shows that, that there are now more Puerto Ricans out. And basically why? Because of the huge migration of Puerto Ricans after 2007, not 2008, which is when the crisis hits the United States, it goes obviously earlier in Puerto Rico, of so many people coming to Texas and Florida, right? So there's that migration. There's the earlier migrations of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, right? And there's also the migration of Puerto Ricans in the 70s and 80s back to Puerto Rico, and then some of them coming back again. But here's a book that I wanted to bring. It's Immigración, Libro para el Pueblo, right? This is a, a book given to immigrants, right, to help prepare them to go, right? So in a sense, I'm using it as a symbol to let you see just how organized it was, right? That, you know, someone would be paid to do the artwork and to write it, and there's a little place where you would write your own name, and it had things for you to do. You what know. year? 1957? Well, th this is 1966, 66. right? You know, and this is book number eight, so there's like seven others, right? But it talks about trabajo en fincas americanas, right? Work in the fields, me voy o me quedo, how do you resolve this dilemma? I have to plead guilty. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let me tell you this anecdote. Oh, please go ahead. I graduated from uh, Maria Zacatolica in 1968. And my first job was with a negociado. It's a very complex, 
where my job was to go out to the campo, right? My partner, and then get this alto parlante, this speaker, and tell them how they can get a job and you know, free tickets. And I remember plane tickets to the to the um, to the United States to work on the farms. I remember these slick looking guys coming to me. Neil, what's <laughs> happening? Because their intention was to get into uh, to New York and you know cutting out. And I was sharing this with a friend once, and I'll end with this. And he says, Yes, I was one of those guys. But I can't, you know, we were treated so badly. He went to a farm in Jersey. He says, you know what I did? I took the bus, I, I had, what is it? I hijacked the bus and I came back to New York. <laughs> so, so, you know, there was a, there were, there were a lot of stories behind these, uh, but uh, I'm sorry, I felt guilty years later. <laughs> when I knew I'm glad you mentioned that, right? Because I mean, so much of the Puerto Rican history of migration here is as rural farm workers. And sometimes Puerto Ricans we don't realize that we think we came to New York City to work in industries and so forth, you know, the, the Brooklyn waterfronts or so, you know, and that's not necessarily true. So much of it was to places like, you know, Hartford, Connecticut wouldn't have existed as a place. And it's like, Hartford, Connecticut is, is the place that probably has the most concentration of Puerto Ricans, right? But they, were, but they went to Hartford a little bit later because ya, el trabajo farm working was going down and so they moved to the cities to jobs, but they were all in the surrounding areas. Springfield, Massachusetts, it's another deeply Puerto Rican city in western Massachusetts. If they got out and I, well, <laughs> they're there, right, for agricultural work, but when the farm work goes away, they start migrating to the cities. So when we think about poverty in the cities, we're thinking, oh, you know, these Puerto Ricans live in the cities and, and they're poor, stuff like that. We don't realize that Part of that poverty is because they're a displaced worker, right? They had a job at some point. They might have still been poor, but um, because of the wages of the jobs. But we understand it as their relationship as Puerto Ricans is to this kind of city, and they must have been on welfare or something. And you don't realize that most of them probably came here to work. The work left. Just like so many other jobs here have left to other countries, well, this also impacted the Puerto Rican community. But if we don't understand that, our understanding of what is the problems of Puerto Ricans becomes very, uh, it, 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 it's like we're understanding the way they talk about it, right? Instead of our understanding of what are kind of our problems and how are they connected to work, wages, and capitalism. And there was a, a Puerto Ricans who went to Hawaii. Yeah. You know the history of that? Yes, yes, the Centro started to write about that. Hawaii, uh, and they thought when we got to Hawaii that they were back in Puerto Rico. <laughs> because they had been literally <coughs> almost hijacked from the island That's right. and then taken by the way of the south. And so when they got to uh, Hawaii, they started kissing the ground and saying, oh, we're home. And they weren't right. in Hawaii. Right. They might have saw the Hawaiians and thinking, coño, te parece? <laughs> 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 I'm glad you mentioned that because one of the things that I think is important to understand about, about Puerto Rican studies is that in many ways it is a field that people who have, have, and I mentioned this a little bit before, people have gotten into it because they're trying to solve these questions about themselves and their history that the question didn't even exist, right? So, so clearly the answers didn't exist, right? And, and when we mentioned earlier about the, the decolonization, right, where people were freeing themselves, the colonies in Africa, that also, you know, in other places where they were throwing off Europe, but they were also throwing off the European systems of education, the books written about, right? And so then there had to be a way of, well, we, we need to write this history ourselves, we need to look into this history, clearly this is not it, right? And so, you know, this is not just um, endemic to us Puerto Ricans, right? It's not just in uh, us who are creating our history, right? 
the history of the entire world has been rewritten because most of the history of the world has been written from very either paternalist or elitist views before, you know, uh, before us. The history of mujeres and all that stuff, right? So our our history is part of a kind of global, right, intent or attempt to recreate our history. Um, many times. It, with pure, with very interesting intentions, right? Not just for the sake of knowledge, but many, many times for the sake of social justice and change. Right? And so I, I, I make that specific for you to realize that education and social change are many times connected together. Right? And that brings us to the next book, um, Oscar's com uh, comments, uh, Desafío y Solidaridad. Right? Again, another attempt um, after uh, C. Lane um, to give a, a brief history of the Puerto Rican workers, uh, workers' struggle. Now, what's interesting is that this book, um, this book comes out of SEDEP, right? This is a, a main, this is one of their main books um, that they put out where they are looking back at the history of the workers' struggle. Um, and it basically picks up different essays by different authors. Um, Genvasio Garcia is one of them, uh, Chuco Quintero is, is one of the other ones, and they're looking back at the history of the earlier 19th century, right? So again, here we have the early 19th century, the 1800s, the mid-1800s, where you see the end of slavery and then the beginning of a bunch of workers organizing, right? Um, Desafío en Solidaridad, just to, if I can say it, is also, it's defiance and solidarity, right? And so they are titling their book, right, as a history of the Puerto Rican labor movement, as basically a history of defiance and solidarity, right, of, of kind of rejecting, right, the, the, the oppression of the either the corporations or the bosses, the patron, right, and building solidarity amongst themselves, okay? And so unsaid, and, and it becomes a little bit clearer in the book that I'm going to talk about, but unsaid is um, who these people are. Uh, we're talking about them as workers, but it's going to become a little bit clearer in some of Sadaf's later works who these folks are. Um, so you're going to leave us hanging? Well, I'm going to talk about that in the next book. Okay. <laughs> so Sedef pulls out another book um, in a, well, that's that's a different picture of different like uh, labor, you know, tabaqueros, uh, sewing garment district, and la caña, right? So the different kind of areas where people did work, you see them kind of mobilizing. And that's one of the things about work is that people mobilized, they were working together, right? So that's where the solidarity comes from. We're, we may have differences of some sort, but by working together, we're able to build solidarity. Yes. Was there any, was there any interface between these workers and these organizers and Sacco and Manzetti? You know, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know that the, the, some of this work does tell you about the strong um, influence of anarchists and anarchism in Puerto Rico. So that is there. And Sacco and Zeddy were two Italian anarchists in the United States who were later executed. Um, and so I, what I've seen is that the, many of these discussions resonated in Puerto Rico, but I haven't seen anything about the Sacco and Zeddy case in particular. Um, there has been stuff about others, but I didn't see that one. I do think that um, Bernardo Vega, um, you see issues in Bernardo Vega where they're talking about the Sacco and Zeddy case, but that's in the United States. I, I don't know if in Puerto Rico. Okay, so here, when we get to La Otra Cara de Historia, oh. this is um, another book uh, put out by Sedef. And if you see the timeline, 1800 to 1925. Now, El Machete de Ocum, which, um, which uh, Lidia Milagros is one of the authors, is also the author, uh, with Chuco Quintero, uh, Angel Quintero, of this book. And in this book, it becomes more explicit. Um, we don't have, I don't think, any pictures, mm -hmm. but this other face, right? If you look at the timeline, 1800 to 1925, what do you think this face looks like? Just think about the time, 1800s, and think about what we've been talking about and what's happening in 1800s. What do you think this face looks like? Did you say face? Yeah, face. Kind of. Well, like that. Like that. Black. Black. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in many ways. And when you look through the pictures, you're looking at Puerto Rico and you're like, Whoa, right? Mm -hmm. Puerto Rico is negro, mulato, mujer. Like, this is, you know, th this Puerto Rico is different from the turismo brochures. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and that's exactly their point, right? Because they're saying, who are we talking about? Well, we can say Puerto Ricans, and that doesn't say enough. We can say workers, and, you know, that's ambiguous, yeah, right? But when you look here, you realize, well, these workers, right? are, it, some of them, they're not workers, some of them are still working in the same fields, right? They're in the same locations, right? 
Tú ves un Puerto Rico mucho más diverso. So it makes sense that in the 70s you have people looking at issues of linguistics, right? Like uh, um, as, as was spoken about earlier, because when you really see what the, the, the dispersal, the, who the people were, the integration, how they lived, where they lived, you realize that our Puerto Rico era mucho más de color. And, and there's been recent studies about Puerto Rico where um, they talked about Puerto Rico as the whitest of the Antilles, right? Puerto Rico politically was a place where when, when they overthrew them in France, when they overthrew the, the Spanish in, in Mexico and in other places, many of those Spanish and French and other elites would come to Puerto Rico, right? But part of the struggle in Puerto Rico that you definitely see is not just the political tension between the classes, the racial tension between the classes, right? And that's, so this struggle captures all of that. Later that plays out in, in some of the independent struggles where um, you'll see some debates where so much of the independent movement comes from some of the elite sectors, right? And you'll see some of this play out in some sections. And that's exactly what C. Lang and others try to point out, right? That this elitist independentista um, grouping cannot, in a sense, represent the, 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 the island Right, or lead it to independence, or even make independence attractive, right, based on their own elitist interests. And so you see that our story has also a lot of fissures and complications and tensions within it. Now, many times folks don't think about using you know, race as a framework to try to understand Puerto Rico, because you'd be like, oh, well, then there's black people, and then there's white people, and there's Asians, and then there's Puerto Ricans and Latinos, right? You know, but that is really a bad way of trying to understand that if we are the product of um, uh, as Akali was mentioning, the four-story country. If the fourth, if the first piece, right? If the first, if the foundation is African, right? Because that's the articulation that Jose Luis Gonzalez says. The first floor is African. The second floor is immigrants, right? Then later he gets on into uh, the other floors. But if if that is the history of Puerto Rico, that means that the formation of Puerto Rico also has to do with people coming from Africa, people coming from Europe, and people come with racial ideas. People get segregated in racial ways, right? The ways of codifying people's identities is a way of keeping them apart and separate, right? So having a racial framework is very much part of uh, most Caribbean countries. If you want to, you know, if you want to look at the history of Haiti and Dominican Republic, right? How do you understand that without being able to understand some of the racial tension? Right? And so I include it because I know that when we talk about the U.S. framework, it's like Latinos are here, blacks are here, white people are there. But in the Caribe, that doesn't work the same way. Right? We have to. Was there any articulation between the Caucasoid haciendados of Puerto Rico mm -hmm. uh, with representatives in the U.S. Congress and the anti bellum South to a next Puerto Rico as there was regarding the anti bellum South and Cuba? Yeah, you know, that, that's a great question. And you see some of the early writings, not in, not in, in some of these books, but in some more recent history, okay. you see relationships where what happened in, um, in, the, in the Haitian Revolution, the elites in Puerto Rico and other places were very scared. There were attempts um, of slave rebellions in, um, in New Orleans, right? Those, you know, at the same time that it's interesting that you could say that workers, there's always this thing about workers internationalism, right? Workers are always kind of in support of each other in other places. Well, so are the elites. Right, the elites are definitely also trying to communicate with each other, and many of these fears would be represented. Um, and so there is work about that, but not here, but in other works okay. um, that people have done. There's a, there's a scholar, um, uh, um, Jorge, um, there's a new scholar who's written a lot about kind of like these racial dynamics um, from the view of, uh, of different elites. Um, um, I, I forget his name. Harson? Jesse, Jesse, Harson, Jesse Harson, something like that. Um, that he writes some about it. So, but you know what's interesting is some people are able to look back using new understandings of, of like race nowadays. In these writings, many like you know, there's the writings that um, that Edis discussed. But in these writings, many times people are looking at the worker as the subject, right, as the agent of history that's going to make change possible. And sometimes that view of, of the worker is a little bit more homogeneous, right? Nowadays. You know, the, the, the universities are teaching new ways of thinking that allow us to look back and say, well, who exactly, you know, the worker is a, is a mujer, is gay, is black, is white. You know, we have new perspectives that allow us to actually look at this, 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 this person in more complex ways. But in this time period, with these books, they're really trying to rescue the history of workers as a particular grouping and, and not getting into kind of like the differences. If I can jump in there real quick, um, I'm going to talk about this more in, in my part, but it's interesting because, for example, in Cuba, you had a, la a large sector of the elite, of the white elite, 
uh, that was towards the end of the 19th century was annexationist. That was the sugar elite, which existed in Cuba in the 19th century. In Puerto Rico, you didn't really have a sugar plantation economy until the Americans arrived. So what you have is that once the Americans arrive and the sugar plantations, the American sugar plantations begin to displace the hacendado elites who were in coffee and other sectors, those were actually, the, the, that sector of the elite was actually the early pro-independence and nationalists. And, and there's been a lot that's been written and debated about that, and I, I'm going to cover it a little more. All right, all right. So can we go to Los Gallos Pallados? Okay, well, so can we go back? So look at this, right? So you mentioned Jesus Colón, right? Well, Jesus Colón's wife was Juana Colón, right? And so look at that face, right? Jesus Colón writes a book. If people know who Piri Thomas is, down these yes. mean streets, yeah. right? He just it's passed gone. away, right? Well, he wrote a book about what it's like being Puerto Rican in black in 50s Harlem Barrio, right? Well, um, a little bit earlier, Right? Jesus Colón and Juana Colón were activists and writers and journalists, um, both engaged, right? And you know, you can in a sense talk about the struggle, their struggle was not just as Puerto Ricans, not just as workers, but there's a, his brother, um, um, uh, Joaquin Colón, writes a lot of the racial tensions at the time and how that influenced uh, Puerto Ricans. That book though by Joaquin Colón is, uh, is a much recent book. So we actually have again, more of this kind of worker understanding of the history um, and not so much the, the racial tensions. But I, um, I wanted to use that picture in perf uh, because I think it captures well what we're trying to say about La Otra Cara de la Historia.